Good afternoon, everybody. Um, everything sound-wise seems okay. Everybody can hear me, I assume. <clears throat> so this is not going to be a demo, but rather a walkthrough of why uh, I think CMMN needs a little help and what I propose to suggest in that regard. CMMN is kind of the, the toddler of the trio. Of the three, of the trio. Um, EPMN has been around for a while, but even prior to it being absorbed by the OMG, it had been around longer than that. And as its various constituent pieces have been around even longer than that. Uh, DMN, uh, despite the fact that it's a recent standard, uh, rules, uh, uh, use, and engine, and modeling, uh, and even decision tables have been around for a while. So it's, it's older than it looks. But CMMN is clearly the toddler of this group. So it's kind of like the straggler of the three kids. They're constantly hanging back, and the other two kids are always saying, well, catch up. So uh, this is an attempt to sort of lay the groundwork for that. The first third of this, I'm going to beat up BPMN. So for those out there that are, are, want to see that, <laughs> you'll enjoy it. For those who think that I'm crazy, uh, you, know, you, could, you feel free to, be ch to challenge me on it. So BPMN's limitations uh, for case management modeling, uh, I think, stem for the central uh, uh, fact that activity, not event, is the quote unquote first citizen in the meta model. So in some sense, virtually everything within the BPMN meta model revolves around uh, activity. Uh, if it were event, then it would be CMMN, because that is the first class citizen in CMMN. So because of that, we are forced to do unusual things with BPMN. Here's an example of an event subprocess. Uh, how many people have actually used this in practice? How many act vendors actually support it? So the number drops a bit. So in some sense, the event subprocess is a rather exotic BPMN uh, construct. It is driven by an event handler which picks up the inbound event either as an interrupting or non-interrupting moment in the execution of the process thread. How it interacts with the main thread is through one of two ways. Either it adds to the data scope, which effectively is what that, out, that data output is creating, because that will then add to the data scope for the parent process, or it can communicate through something like a signal, which can communicate within a process, information. And that can have an event-like impact on the thread. So this is, this is basically how an event subprocess interacts with the main process uh, in a case or event-driven kind of way. This is an even weirder construct, uh, event-driven process flow. And this would be a li little bit controversial. The idea here was take sequence flow out of the mix, force all advancement of the token to be driven by events. This has some rather unusual consequences. In BPMN, the uh, life cycle of a BPMN activity says you can only do this in between the states called completing and completed. So if an activity is occurring and its input requirements and resource requirements, if applicable, are satisfied, then the activity moves from, active, uh, from ready to active. It then becomes completed when the work is done, but it doesn't quite get there. It has this weird interim state called completing. In the spec, the only way that it talks about that, in terms of the execution semantics, is with the non-interrupting events. So that's why you see the non-interrupting events as the border. Now, I suppose a BPMS engine could figure out a way to hold the task state in completing and still allow the interrupting event to also uh, interfere with the execution. But once it gets past that point, there's no other things that can happen. So even if the token cannot advance out of an activity, and I'll explain why that's the case here, you cannot interrupt it any further. There's, according to the life cycle diagram, once it's completed, you can't go back and do anything else with it. So um, the reason the token sits here is because if the event fires, then the token will advance to the next activity and, the next thing, and, and we repeat again because that, the only way to advance out of the next one, next one is also another event. And so the token, in a sense, gets trapped from a BPMN semantic standpoint. The only way to ensure that once you're done with the process that you clear the pipes out is to use the terminate end event, which basically wipes everything out. So it's a rather weird set of things to, to, to use, and it's all forced on us because BPMN semantics make us go there when we have to uh, try to do 
ECA-like treatment within BPMN. And then the third is the stuff that you've seen already, the ad hoc subprocess. Uh, the order of execution and completeness condition is, more, is generally specifiable, but ultimately the performer doing the work has the right to trump that. So uh, it's execution semantics are a little odd, and we saw an example earlier today of one attempt to resolve that. They wrapped extensions around the construct and gave it extra oomph from an event-driven standpoint to, to give it some, some context, literally making the ad hoc subprocess like a container of what was going on. Uh, the last, though, is the example that's in the spec, which is the use of uh, data associations to, in effect, mimic the effect of control flow. It's not strictly control flow, but it does mean that the activity to the bottom right uh, is waiting on a mandatory data input from a, that, that is from the data object in the middle, and it can't advance uh, to complete it unless it receives that. So you can mimic the effect of control flow in the ad hoc subprocess. So the result is that BPMN, when trying to use it for case management modeling, relies on little used and exotic BPMN elements. Now that's my term, exotic. I mean, they're just not used very often. Uh, and then worse, uh, imposes these really strange constraints and rules on us. So you can do something like that, but uh, perhaps there's a better way. So here's an example of a narrative, and you know, I believe this presentation is going to be made available, so uh, I'm not going to ask you to read it strictly. Just focus on the text in green. So once all relevant information is recorded and received, if initially missing, then the claim is said to be established. So if I look at this from a BPMN standpoint, it will look something like this. So as you see, I've used a series of boundary events, both non-interrupting and interrupting, to capture the changes in state of the claim in order to direct it into the pathways that it's supposed to go. So some of these things are relatively clear. Some of these are not quite. For example, how do we actually exit the system is a little strange. It's a bit obfuscated with the use of the end events the way they're set up. One of the point, this is a very difficult to explain diagram. Unless you're well grounded in BPMN semantics, uh, this would be a challenge to explain to the typical average lay BPMN user. Very difficult to change. That's the next point. So here's what it would look like in case in CMMN. So you have essentially all of the same aspects of this situation accounted for, but it's a much cleaner representation because primarily there's no worry about flow. There's only dependencies and state and events. Now, let's change the text just slightly. If we change the text to say, once basic information is recorded, once basic information is recorded, then the claim is said to be established, allowing additional or missing information to be added later. Quite frankly, I don't know what that would look like in BPMN. I have no idea. I don't really feel inclined to figure it out. In CMMN, that's all I had to do. I drew one line differently, which is one connector to, from one end to another, from one target reference to another. And that was enough to then capture the semantics of the behavior that I'm trying to describe. So let me let that sink in for a bit. So there's not really a good equivalence between BPMN and CMMN. Sometimes there is. But I'd say at best you can, you can strive for our rough equivalences, and there will be a the more unstructured the situation is, the harder it will be to, to capture it in BPMN, whereas the easier it will be to capture it in CMMN. So the BPMN 2.0 conundrum. We've heard throughout the two days that uh, it's very, BPMN is very execution oriented and blah, 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 blah. The, the irony is that you actually have, in the two camps that divided after 2.0 came out, Hatfields and McCoys being those who are pure process modelers versus those that are attached to the execution engines. Right? So the process modelers say, this is too execution oriented. I'm going to ignore most of it. And the spec actually gave them a way out with things like the descriptive conformance class and the analytic conformance class to, in effect, sort of wall off things that they didn't want to have to understand. The, uh, the irony of it is that the execution vendors 
thought that the execution semantics were inadequate. So they try to fix it in their own way, which is to either ignore certain things or to get very creative interpreting how to do it. To the point that really it's the rare vendor out there who is strictly speaking 100% down the line with BPMN 2.0 execution semantics. Everybody is falling it to various degrees short of that standard. So I think it's weird that we have this effect that one party thinks it's too execution oriented and the other party thinks it's that it's not enough. So the result is we may have reached a ceiling or a set of ceilings with BPMN 2.0. That the uh, vendor adoption probably is maxed out. And what motive do they have to make it more execution-like uh, in terms of the BPMN semantics? Not much. And certainly with the modelers, in my experience, um, I find that most of the business analysts who attempt to do modeling ignore 80% or 90% of the modeling language. It's little better than fancy flow charting just with a stylized tool, you know, set of notational elements. So if that's the case, maybe there's an opening <laughs> for CMMN 1.x. So I'm going to suggest an argument that the modelers, in this case, again, the business analyst, uh, may be more inclined to model declaratively than procedurally. If we can just wean them away from an over-reliance on flow, which they don't really understand anyway, all right, then we can just talk about them modeling declaratively to capture the what of, that, of the something that's happening as opposed to the how of it. And then, if that's the case, right, on the vendor side, uh, the execution semantics for CMM are a lot cleaner and simpler. And to a large extent, don't need to have state management in the traditional sense that BPMS vendors have treated it. Meaning that the app server is a nice to have, but not necessary. So a lot of case management vendors out there actually don't use an application server in the strict sense to manage the, the threat of the uh, process instance. This last point, though, and this is a setup for, for Keith's talk tomorrow, um, is that we, we really don't yet have a language, a modeling language, even a vocabulary that we can all agree to, to describe truly, and I call it stateless ACM. I think Keith's going to have a different term for it tomorrow. But when I talk about ACM, you know, I'm, I'm referring to this idea that you have um, endlessly rearrangeable, self-assembling stateless nodes that can arrange themselves into whatever the pattern or pathway that the situation warrants based on e ECA kind of logic. The event that happened, the condition that attaches to the event and the action that occurs and the consequence of that action. We don't really have a language yet. So CMM doesn't get there. But it takes us part of the way away from EPMN, which is more of a structured language. So, uh, if that's the case, then I'm here to suggest a, a, a modest proposal on how to improve the possibilities of adoption of CMMN. So I think uh, I'm going to build directly off of what Denis did. So that you have up to a couple years ago, where BPMN was the only thing that was there, the process model became the be all of the construct. Right? Everything was folded into that. All decision logic was realized through process structure. Case-like actions were, were realized through event-driven moments within the process model. There was no other way to do it. And so it's in a sense, it's like what flying buttresses had, were like when you, when you had to use that construction technique. You could create very beautiful and elegant things like Notre Dame. But they're very flat. They don't go very high because there's only so much that pattern of construction can uh, handle from a, a uh, a load-bearing support standpoint. But you saw in the example just a few minutes ago what the future looks like when you have these separation of concerns between process understanding, where it's really activity and control flow, decision as a set of hierarchical ex uh, 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 logical uh, uh, action, uh, logical deductions and inferences, and then with CMMN to capture from the state standpoint, the event-driven standpoint. We can now talk about much more elegant structures, like the Eiffel Tower, taller, more beautiful, scalable. So to do th to that in, this is uh, the table, one of the core tables out of the CMMN spec. And so you see across the top, 
you see the, uh, the element uh, characteristics. These are like the add-ons that uh, are attributes of the elements to the column in the far left. And so the suggestion is going to be that first we get rid of plan fragment, which no one understands anyway. So a plan fragment is, of course, a vestige of some probably uh, drunken moment by the task force. It's, it's, its semantics are unclear, to say the least. Uh, it's, it's better interpreted as just a super type of, of the stage, which does have clear semantics and resembles very much a kind of subprocess concept in CMMN in that it has scope and behaviors and, and boundaries. Next, I'm going to get rid of all of the, the notational attribution. Not because it's not important, it's just that if I'm trying to get the business analyst to just focus on what has to happen, then let them just do that. And then when you go to the execution, you can add these attributes, in particular the required flag, right? And Denise and I have had a long conversation about the role that it should play. I think that's something should ever, everybody should realize that in CMMN, you really have the tasks that are enabled, and the assumption is that they're automatically enabled, but you do have this manual activation possibility, right? They only become required if you actually flag them that way, and they only become discretionary if you actually flag them that way. So we're going to keep the discretionary, which is not a notational marker. It's actually a shape marker. The other thing to keep in mind about uh, required is that, as Denise said in his presentation, it only comes into play if you're really trying to figure out what has to happen before the case is, can be considered over, unless it is trumped by something that is more important, such as a, an event that terminates the case, you know, achieves an exit, uh, uh, the condition for the exit century, which essentially terminates the case. Uh, and if you ever have seen the activity, a life cycle diagram in BPMN and wondered, man, that is, look, that is strange, try looking at this, the uh, life cycle diagrams at CMMN, they are even weirder. They're essentially Rorschach tests. You'll figure out what you think they mean. So the, what's left is this core uh, set of elements and their decorators. So a planning table needs to be there because whenever we have a discretionary uh, item, um, the planning table comes into being because that's where we describe um, the rules for acting on the, dis the discretion uh, uh, at runtime. And then the inter criteria and exit criterion are the centuries that, that are the C in the ECA uh, pattern uh, that's at the core of, of CMMN. So, looking at these a little bit more individually, uh, these are the set of elements that facilitate the representation of something that is presumed enabled and occurs. So, state is generally going to be the result of one of these things happening, right? Occurring. And then the discretionary aspect that was down here, and uh, I did not include the discretionary stage. I, that's my oversight, but that's also possible. That's also considered part of this restricted subset. So uh, it's just tough to squeeze in there. But when you see the, the stage, the stage can also be discretionary. So these are things that, that facilitate, uh, if you will, the use of CMN to model state machine kind of patterns. Right? Because you can use them, particularly pairing up milestones, which are a nice statement about the stage that is reached, uh, that the, about the state that is reached within uh, the, CM, the, the case model, uh, to basically represent the flow of the life cycle of a case as a state machine construct. The rest of these are more for the ECA flavor. So you have this thing off to the left, which says this is a case file item, so that's a data object of some kind. And it's a rival, it's on part, there are different state, there are different values for what the on part means, but basically it, you know, it's created or it's updated or there's like three or four others. Uh, and then you can have the condition attached to the entry, uh, 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 the, uh, entry uh, criteria, right, a century. And in this model, that would say that this activity cannot begin essentially until that document has arrived. That would be one example of how to use it. So in effect, data is an event type. It's just not visualized that way or represented that way in the model. But basically, the arrival of data is just another kind of event. 
And then you have the elements that, that strictly speak to the events that are understood, uh, such as timer events and user events. And those, those are sort of, along with the uh, shapes of task and, uh, and case file item are kind of uh, legacy handovers or, or hand-me-downs, if you will, uh, from BPMN. And then the rest of it would be the uh, entry and exit uh, centuries in order to, again, fill out the, the event condition act or ECA aspect of CMMN. So in closing, I think the thing I want to emphasize is one of the reasons I think that this has a chance uh, of being more successful with the business analyst community, given a, a chance to do so, is that I think it speaks closer to what's important to them. This is a sort of rudimentary uh, uh, business architecture construct, a value map, in which we have uh, value streams that decompose into something called value stages. Uh, I've shown provisional mappings for how a case or a process map over to those. Uh, we have a stakeholder off to the side, which can be you know, involved in the production of the value stream or its consumption or its facilitation. And I would assert that I can make those mappings. So if you were to give me a, a business architecture for an organization, I'm pretty sure I could derive a case model for that. And not, to, and, and not take too much time to do so, because I think these mappings, while not one-to-one, -one, are strong enough to suggest that the naming of things will carry over as well as their uh, set of compositional relationships. I'll assert something similar on, on a capability model, which if you, in business architectures, those are the two things that generally get done. You either do a value map for your organization or you do a capability map. Uh, it's rare that you do both, but if you do both, then you're more advanced than most. Here, if I look at it from just the capability standpoint, again, I'm going to assert that I can make some mappings from the business architecture construct to a case model. So the notion is that the business analyst, armed with this information, will be better able to start modeling because they don't have to worry about capturing operational behaviors at a procedural level, which is what they would do with BPMN. I've just not found business analysts typically savvy enough to make that transition. And I found BPMN modelers, including myself, to anal about it to work up to their level of abstraction. So here's an example of a CMMN model. This is something I just created as a lark, if you will based upon my work at the VA, in which I did actually do some BPMN modeling of some extent. And so you have uh, basically a, a claim management construct here for case management. And I could make these assertions pretty well, that uh, uh, the qualified claim is a milestone, is essentially the outcome of the stage qualified claim uh, maps to some kind of value stage in a value stream. I can make the assertion that, I think I can validate the assertion that uh, a claim form is a case, as a case file item will map to some kind of information object within the organization's information model, and so on. So one of the things that will have to be done is to divorce the analyst's uh, predisposition to be focused on, well, if I don't see an arrow drawing uh, with, a, with a, you know, a line with an arrowhead on it showing me a direction of flow, I don't know what it means. If, if you can't get out of that moment, CMMN is not for you. But CMMN doesn't need flow to make a meaningful statement about what is supposed to happen. And then last, but not least, um, I'm borrowing this, or actually I crafted this for a colleague, and he's actually using it in a paper. Uh, uh, Frank Kowalski and, and Gil Aware from Knowledge Consultants. And they have something, and they teach this, called an external architecture. So they have, they start with a set of tables off to the far left there, where they map markets and products for organization. And they do the kind of traditional kind of market analysis, uh, analysis that, that you might think in that context. But then they basically attach that to a business architecture through a series of derivative tables. So you will uh, create an interim construct that maps products to the capabilities that deliver them, or you'll map products to the value streams that produce them. And then you derive the table that allows for the capabilities to now have a market face to them, or the value streams to now have a market face to them. 
Suddenly, with only two hops from the model concept in the CMMN model, I'm now talking about what the things in the model mean in terms of the market in which I compete. That's a lot harder to do with BPMN. And I'm, uh, the assertion here is that because it's easier with CMMN, we have a chance to have some outreach with the business analyst community. You can actually take this one step further, right? Customer journey mapping with its sort of high level expressions of the evolution of the consumer, or the customer rather, and their experience of what's being provided to them, um, essentially can also be thought of as states of the case if you're talking about an externally facing case management situation. So these are, these are real hardcore business architecture constructs that are even further out to the external world than the one before. But all of them, I can now make very clean and clear connections to things in the CMMN model, which would be a lot harder to do if I was trying to represent them with BPMN. So that's it.